feature presentation. Welcome back to another Untitled Movie Review. I am one of your hosts, Matt Rohrbeck. Goes alongside, he's allergic to tomatoes, but he is tomato meter approved, Eric Marchin. Matt, your voice went a little dark there. Are you channeling your inner uh, Roger L. Jackson, a.k.a. Yes, Ghostface? Yes. Uh, Eric, what's your favorite scary movie? Matt, that's a good question. Um, I don't know if we have enough time to discuss that, but there is some interesting uh, opinions when it comes to what is the best of certain franchises within uh, one of the most iconic franchises uh, in slasher film history, uh, that being the sixth installment of Scream, uh, where you have legacy and franchise battling it out for uh, control. And I think that that's going to be a very interesting conversation to have uh, for a movie like this in, in terms of where this franchise has kind of started in, you know, the, the mid to late nineties and then kind of evolved over time and turned into this weird self-referential kind of thing, even more so than that first movie. So yeah, there's, there's a lot to unpack here, but there's also a lot we're going to have to, I guess, tiptoe around because of the, the spoilers. Spoilers. Yeah. No spoilers in this review of radio silences. Screevy. Uh, starring Melissa Barrera, Jasmine Savoy Brown, Jack Champion, uh, Henry Cerny, Mason Gooding, uh, Dermot Mulrooney, Jenna Ortega, Tony Revioli, Josh uh, Segura, who was just in She-Hulk. I like that guy a lot. Some, uh, I, I did not. Gonna, oh yeah, we know she's in it. Okay, Samara Weaving, Hayden Panettiere, uh, and Courtney Cox, and more. Yes, Eric. No spoilers to be heard in this review of Screevy. Uh, we're doing completely spoiler free. Uh, the movie does come out technically tonight as we posted this. So people will be able to find out who the killer is uh, tonight, but no spoilers. Uh, we, you know, if you don't want to know anything, probably don't listen to this. Wait, because like we'll we'll talk about things, but we're not going to say exactly what happened. Obviously, that's how one of our reviews work. Uh, but yeah, Eric, you you set it up perfectly. A scream, a franchise that is uh, near and dear to my heart, probably my introduction to a lot of the horror franchises that it was kind of referencing and, and, and name dropping in, in that original film, because like it came out at a perfect time for me, the first film in the 90s. I remember Ghostface being almost that first iconic new like horror villain slasher um, in my memory. And I remember my sister being absolutely terrified of the ghost face mask. I dressed up as ghost face for Halloween because it scared the shit out of her as a brother, a good brother does. Um, and yeah, I've, I've loved this franchise, all the ups and downs um, of it. Um, it's been all over the place. That's for sure. Um, but, uh, you know, this reinvention of the franchise was last year's Scream, which was Scream 5 or 5 Cream. Um, I've been kind of, you know, I liked that movie quite a bit, but um, found it just kind of like a fun, forgettable film. Um, and I actually kind of really surprisingly, uh, really, really, really liked uh, Screevy. So uh, how'd you feel? Yeah, I, I, I think I felt the same way. Uh, Scream 5 has a really, probably the best performance of, of David Arquette's career. Yeah, in that movie. I got he the uh, Dewey mustache going on right now. Uh, you got to play so. the, the, the Dewey's yeah. theme, <laughs> the Broken yeah. Arrow theme. Um, yeah, so that movie that features, I think, his best performance. This film, you know, taking the Woodsboro characters, the core four, as they're known, the survivors from the last movie out of Woodsboro, going from the West to East coast and, and, you know, transplanting them into New York, you know, there's an expectation of, you know, it being bigger and, and bloodier. And it definitely delivers on both of those stances. The movie funnily enough was shot actually in Montreal, uh, which also kind of plays nicely into the symmetry between uh, Friday the 13th, part eight uh jason takes manhattan because the majority of that movie was shot in vancouver and there took place go. on a boat a boat and then it was only the last 10 minutes 10 minutes when they actually arrived in Are new in york manhattan. city <laughs> uh so it's just kind of like a, like the ultimate like uh false advertisements uh there i feel like it's someone like ja rule talking about like uh, the fire island thing being like it's just it's just false sure, advertising yeah. um yeah, yeah, but yeah. for jason but 
when you're watching something like this, you you have those expectations. Okay, how are they going to utilize New York in a way that's going to be exciting? Mm -hmm. And through the promo material, we're not spoiling anything here. You know, you've seen a lot of, of focus on you know, using uh, the, the, the metro system and, and using yeah. transportation. Subway system, yeah. yeah. And so that, I think, is one of the more sort of intense sequences in terms of suspense. But it's also a movie that's... And uniquely weird. New York, too, right? Yeah. yeah. But it's also a film that is more accessible, I think, to non-horror fans. It's still gory, uh, and that might be a turnoff. But in terms of the jump scare element, it's almost lacking in that, or it's undercut right. by the humor so much that when you're watching it, you you're, you're laughing with the kind of ridiculous aspects of, of the exploitation that's at yeah. play. And also again, the social commentary that all of these movies have where it's taking the temperature of, you know, the horror genre and the culture that kind of surrounds it, whether it be film bros or just the idea of what, horror is now whether it be elevated or conspiracy you know, theories and uh, yeah like yeah like and online said, whatever, culture as well online culture yeah and i think that's where scream is at its best in this movie yeah i absolutely agree like i feel like it is brutal i would never say it's scary but i mean it depends on that's subjective i think to everyone like my wife came and saw this movie with us and she doesn't do well with gore um or jump scares but the scream franchise i think because of that humor, the like dark humor and the, the satire, the social satire, the commentary, all that stuff really works for her. And um, yeah, I found all of that to be kind of just on another level in this movie. Like I feel like from the opening get go, like without spoiling, like the uh, scream openings are so iconic. Um, and I absolutely loved this one. And like it was kind of uh, it's unique and i it, right off the bat it made me go what the hell are they doing in this movie and um it's brutal um it touches on some you know very modern uh things that other movies have have touched on i don't want to say too much but like it 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 does it in such a fun way that's still scary without being jump scary and things like that and brutal um, the comedy throughout, I think the, um, it's both campy, um, it's intentionally funny at times, unintentionally funny at other times. Um, I thought the whodunit of it all to be kind of, um, constantly making me second guess. And that's what, again, that part of scream has always been fun of like the reveal of who the killer is and the meta-ness of the whole movie kind of taking down, like you said, film franchises and legacy characters and like I, it, taking the temperature of both film uh, in general, like film culture, uh, cinema culture, movies, um, as your dog's uh, ghost face is here, Eric. Um, so taking the temperature of what, you know, like you said, film bros or just what people are going to see at the movies and franchises are the biggest thing right now. Um, that versus legacy characters. And then like some of that stuff can easily get to the point where you're like, Ugh, or like a little too much. And that's happened throughout this franchise as well. Um, but I think the radio silence guys are finding their footing when it comes to this franchise. And you can tell that they grew up with it and they really loved it. And they love horror movies, obviously. And I feel like it has more of a stamp from them in this movie than the last one did as well. And and you'll know based on characters who have been cast or not characters, people who've been cast in the film and stuff like that. Um, but I found them coming into their own and making it their own and that same kind of dark humor that was in um, Ready or Not or something like that. And um, I just felt like that carried it. And it, it was hilariously campy, brutally violent. Um, the commentary, um, I think, uh, is 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 f interesting. Um, the who done it? The one thing I will say, like the whole maybe last act, the original reveal, I was kind of like, oh, okay. Um, but as it kind of kept going, I was like full in onto the the camp of it. Um, and I just, yeah, I had an absolute blast. I also want to say quickly before I pass it over to you, um, I think we reviewed five cream here. I remember it wasn't that long ago and I said, I didn't love Melissa Barrera in the last movie. Like I felt like she, 
I don't know. Like I know these movies are over the top and have some heightened kind of acting and things like that, but she just didn't work for me. Um, I thought she absolutely, absolutely crushed it in this and like her and, and the relationship with her sister played by Jenna Ortega. Like um, I thought that completely worked in this where in the last one, I never bought into her performance. I love that core four um, in the film and like that, ongoing kind of bit throughout uh the new characters that they bring in um i think are a lot of fun like i think uh you know right away going tony ravioli and then uh, <laughs> uh um i'm like okay and then like I'm intrigued. I, I i am intrigued and uh, you know i i think you know I, I i just really had a good time with this as a scream fan as a horror fan um just had an absolute blast I'm tiptoeing around stuff. It's hard. Sorry, guys. <laughs> it, it is. It is difficult because it's like part of you is like, okay, like, it, it, is this giving away something or is this not? I mean, that's why I want to talk about the opening, but the opening is is really great and the commentary there is yeah. great and like it, you know, plays with your expectations a lot too. Yeah, when it comes to the openings, uh, out of the, the 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 six films, I would say five of the six openings work really well with yeah i agree maybe the exception of four being kind of the least memorable because it's almost like doing the meta thing within a meta movie almost kind of throws it off a little bit like even three which is in my opinion the worst one the opening sequence with cotton weary played by Liev schreiber 100 percent cotton his talk show <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, is yeah. incredible and like he that character i still think is one of the best in in this franchise and it goes to that sort of you know construct of people believing what they see on tv and now people believing what they read on message boards and falling down rabbit holes and kind of going also into that was theories. spider i didn't even know that yeah, was spider <laughs> so less obnoxious in this and not with dreadlocks uh jack champion uh as kind of one of the the, the new members of the of the group in, in the college crowd and yeah i think the, the the relationship between sam and tara the carpenter sisters in this is a little bit more fleshed out but i think making it a little bit more cartoonish or goofy at times really works well for melissa brera who can kind of sink her teeth in yeah. to the darker side of who she is as a person yeah. and how kind of silly that is in terms of just a writing exercise for uh guy busick and uh james vanderbilt who uh, uh wrote zodiac where you know you're, you're playing with the mythology of the series and again there's that interesting kind of um tug of war between okay well how can a franchise move on without you know its legacy characters or does it need them to begin with or does it just need you know the 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 visual representation of ghostface because in, yeah. in a lot of ways ghostface like jason or like freddy um or like the bride and ready or not which gets a fun little reference in that one uh subway sequence um are almost as iconic or even more so than their films, even, you know, Pinhead and Hellraiser. Like you look at those, those movies and a lot of them are subpar, especially with the sequels, mm. but the visual idea of them is so striking. And there is something that is kind of everlasting, you know, that they can continue on without these actors, but it is also strange, you know, with a movie that is paying tribute to what has come before not Being having first Nev film. Campbell yeah. uh, as Sidney Prescott, who has been in all of them. And it's the same kind of adjustment to not having, you know, Wes Craven being a director on all these movies. Obviously, Wes Craven mm -hmm. having passed away where, you know, with Nev Campbell, it was a salary dispute. And, you know, she knew her worth and the equality wasn't there when it came to the studio you know what they were offering her and what she felt was uh, uh, uh you know better suited because of of her you know presence and her performance and and how much of a pivotal role Sydney Prescott has been in these movies it, it's it, it does take you out when they do reference her and it's also you know like you could have this conversation even with you know Creed 3 right now where you know Stallone not being in yeah. Creed 3 where it's a great you, comparison actually you have these two kind of legacy characters that have kind of propped up the next sort of generation of these films and being established in you know one or 
a, a couple of these sequels and being so tightly knit to the new characters that when you try to extract them from you know whether it be again a salary dispute or creative differences and then when you try to kind of remove them it's it's harder to believe why they're gone even though right. like you understand i think you can understand more why someone like sydney would not want to be involved and like you, you in get new york that. yeah but then like again you start to think to yourself okay well if this is a movie that is like really you know looking at the first five films and where it's come and where it's going and and what that means as a franchise and not necessarily just a legacy and sort of taking the idea of these characters as 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 not being the reason why they have been these movies have been so popular because in, in some ways they haven't you know it's it's again the 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 genre and the villain of the piece and so when you're doing that and then you're also trying to have that nostalgic kind of you know call yeah. back to what's come before it's almost like it is trying to have its cake and eat it too, or trying to sure. balance it. And like you have to have, I think you do have to have a line of like what's going on with Sydney because then it's even You worse. have to. Yeah, no, I agree with that. And I guess that's why you have someone like Hayden Penetier come back as, as Kirby, which um, I know you're not a huge Scream 4 fan. I, I like Scream 4 quite a bit. Um, but She's good I, I Scream get... 4 though. I, I think she is yeah. like, she, it's not that... I don't because I don't like Scream Four. I think Scream Four, I, although there are moments that are very brutal that I think work quite well, like when Anthony Anderson's character is stabbed in the face, like in the it head. Is, yeah, it is. And this movie has some once. of those moments too. Yeah. Um, I would say probably some of the most brutal and creative kills throughout too. Like I like that they always try to find new ways for Ghostface to like kill people and and um. But yeah, I, I like you know Kirby coming back for this as another legacy character because if you are talking about legacy Super characters, Super Scream Brothers. That, um, that unfortunately Dewey is, uh, is, you know, may he rest in peace, um, not with us anymore. I think bringing back another legacy character, um, in Kirby, like, um, I think is a good call and unexpected what they do with her. I, I like, I, and I like her in the fourth movie and I like her coming back here. Like if you were to bring back a character, um, I guess she's one of the only survivors of that movie. Right. Uh, other yeah. than the, the original legacy and even then we didn't know she survived until the last movie when they had it on like a YouTube video or something like that. So, um, the ultimate yeah, man, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm kind of with you with the, the Sydney stuff. Like I didn't necessarily, and this is no offense to Nev Campbell. Like I didn't miss her. Like I missed Rocky in Creed three. Like I felt like Rocky's presence, um, like was really missing from Creed three um and maybe we'll review that um i would still love to talk to you about that movie but um i i didn't this sounds bad but like i didn't miss sydney in this movie but it also like i was i was fine with moving ahead with this new core four right but i i understand what you're saying of when you focus so much on franchise and when legacy characters don't matter and i'm the one that's kind of like you know amplifying that right now by saying even Sydney doesn't matter in this like you almost wanted to give her a proper send off and or something and I'm not saying they needed to kill her or or whatever um like although that could have been a fun way to open the movie if she did come back for it but that's kind of cliche in itself right like I, I almost wish that they would start with you thinking that and something else happens, but I don't know. I'm sure maybe like if, you know, radio silence will do a third one and maybe they, they fix that kind of dispute. Right. And they pay her what she deserves and, and have her come back for, um, for whatever, maybe the last one or whatever. And like, know that it's her last appearance instead of it just kind of feeling like she's written out of the story right and i do agree that they did it in a way where it's like okay it's in new york city like sometimes it feels sillier when the characters do come back and you're like why would you why why i was on vacation like, and i happened just to yeah. run into you guys yeah <laughs> or like even in some of the other ones like she always comes back to woodsboro and something like that and you're like no you fucking wouldn't you have a family now like you would stay the hell away man like um so i don't i i do buy into it um that like for her not to be it. And I, I will unfortunately be on the side of like, I didn't necessarily like miss her presence. Like I think having both Gail and Kirby in this movie as the legacy characters were enough. And there's a lot of characters already with like the new, like the, 
people returning from the last film. You have Spire. new characters, like we said, by Spider um, <laughs> and, and Dermot Mulroney um, and, uh, you know, t- Tony Ravioli, Josh uh, Segura, who I like a lot. And um, yeah, it's just you have so many people already that I feel like, you know, it was OK for for Sydney not to be in this. But um, I, yeah, I can see I, it coming back. I think part of it that also kind of when you're thinking about her not being a part of it you you are also looking at it from the perspective of like okay well why does gail weathers need to be in this this movie then as well because it i kind agree of felt like five kind of wrapped up the dewey gale story in a like way like i'm that, fine if kirby would have come back but not gail that's the thing where like if you're if you're bringing in a new legacy character that hasn't really been uh, you know a part of the, the franchise for the majority of these movies you know it's a way of kind of you know tiptoeing around that salary dispute i guess you know from from a studio perspective and also from a screenwriting perspective but when you're bringing in you know uh courtney cox again courtney cox has been also a part of the entire franchise and she's been there you know present with nev campbell and and david arquette since that first movie and so there is that kind kind of you know attachment to thinking like oh well if courtney cox is here you know shouldn't nev campbell be here as well and Mm -hmm. you're thinking about that when you see her because she has been a part of this entire franchise as well and so that attachment is 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 strong with with her in in you know being not just the the only one the sole survivor of this original uh franchise coming back where it's like okay well maybe they should have you know written her out and or made another reporter type character or something and and focused it on kirby or bring another person back that maybe survived in part four that we're not thinking of or i mean they kind of did with with mary shelton in the last movie um as well but uh spoiler alert they that's true well. yeah i forgot but, that she but, was yeah but again like not really a memorable character not nothing against her i, I really and she like was mary also shelton, from but, four as well right yeah 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 mary shelton she was also was from one four of the, right the police officers in four and they brought yeah. her back as a legacy character in five but nobody really you know four is one of those movies where it's like okay spoiler alert emma roberts is one of the killers and then like you're kind of reminded by that in in one scene in this movie of of you know the previous killers but it it, it was like that moment of like oh yeah there were two killers in four it wasn't just one yeah because like that final act in part four is so over the top uh, in the hospital that you kind of remember. Oh, it goes on too long. Else. I agree. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I like four, but it should have ended an act earlier. <laughs> like yeah. really like it, you didn't need all that extra shit. Um, but talking about legacy and what this movie is with the commentary on, on franchises and, and, and film uh, where we are at within as a film industry and things like that. Like I, I you brought this up already, but I do feel like, we're at an interesting spot with scream where the first scream was referencing all these other classic horror movies and things like that. And now we've gotten to a point where it's referencing itself and it's done that in the past as well. But this movie specifically, like I wouldn't even say that there's many, there's a nod to a couple other movies and and horror franchises. Some vary on the nose and, and others you know in a classic scream way but for the most part this movie without talking about it too much is very much just referencing all the other scream movies and i think that's kind of interesting as a commentary on a franchise like you've been going so long where you were originally inspired by other stuff in in a genre you're now kind of even it's even that legacy sequel thing which they talked about a lot a lot in the last film but like well, the um, requel part of it, the too, requel right? too, right? Which is basically what a, a legacy sequel kind of is, right? Of like, it's like in Jurassic World having to go back to the seeing the old fucking helmet the kid wore in the in the dusty old room, right? Ghostbusters Afterlife, all these movies doing the same kind of thing, and I think it's like you get to a point where you know you were inspired by something, and now you're inspired by yourself, and like I think that's kind of interesting, and the movie does that in kind of a fun countdown kind of way um and uh i again tiptoeing around stuff but it's fun like i thought that who done it is very easy to follow with the countdown and trying to figure out in the movies all the screen movies are very silly but very creative in the way where they mislead you in certain places or the number of killers and and you know 
um, how they kind of explain everything is often goofy and over the top. And I feel like, but it's still exciting and it's not necessarily a whodunit in a sense where you want to figure out the killer or you even need to, or you're trying to outsmart the movie um, because sometimes they're so ridiculous that like you're, you're, you're not going to get there or like something like that. And this movie is very self-referential as this franchise um, to the point where it misleads you in a certain way and then gets to a point that you should have seen coming, but you almost don't because they throw so much at you um that i thought was a lot of fun and you brought up other scream movies too like you brought up three being the worst movie um which i don't disagree with um but scream three probably the campiest of all of the scream movies so i feel like there is an element of scream three in this movie as well although scream two has campiness you know um the original is probably the the least campy out of them. And then they got campier and campier until four tried to do its own thing. But um, I just like that it, it was an interesting deconstruction and that's what these movies are always good at of, of a franchise and self referencing and that meta ness, not in the obnoxious way, like you're talking about in scream four with the, like the intro, but like in a fun way of deconstructing what, the scream movies were as well so yeah it's uh it was fun man it was good yeah and 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 again like screams referencing itself in in a way that is still somewhat removed because it's referencing is itself as the stab movies so it's kind yes, of yes that's always that. been there right yeah yes yeah, which we don't really film. get in this movie do we no no i mean they they, they talk about like um like the message boards and like past sure. films and stuff like that and also oh wait you know, yeah we do okay yeah yeah, yeah 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 but but it's not as he- like i i would say like two the, the the opening of two which is one of my i mean the first one is is perfect with drew barrymore but like that, yeah the that second, second they're one, all good too but yeah. but the second one is is where they really introduce you know the the stab movie with heather graham playing drew barrymore in the opening scene when jada pinkett smith and omar yeah. are watching the movie and then the third one is really kind of um where that kind of surrealist quality and that meta quality comes into play even more because it's on the set of a stab movie and so you're you're kind of entrenched in the the meta humor and kind of the uh over the top nature that is hollywood you know even with people like Roger Corman and Lance Hendrickson having cameos yeah. and and the the kind and of coming like, off the new nightmare side. we've always talked about as well right where well, was crazy yeah. new nightmare but well, new new nightmare was was a prototype but there were two other movies before the scream franchise that kind of played a role in kind of being early um meta horror films and those two films were uh jason lives friday the 13th part six and then there is a very small little horror movie called there's nothing out there that vinegar syndrome released where it's about a group of people that go out into this cabin in the middle of the woods and one of the characters is kind of like um a jamie kennedy-esque kind of guy where like he he's seen the horror movies and uses his knowledge to warn the other people in his group um so like there's that aspect of it but then again you look at where horror has gone where you know after scream 4 kind of came and went you, you had something like the cabin in the woods kind of picking up the slack a little bit and kind of playing within that milieu totally. as well but doing it in an even more subversive way where like it really kind of like almost held you know uh the culture's feet to the fire and said like look how silly some of this stuff is but also it embraced it in a way that kind of felt earned where it became it as it was going along but still was yeah. able to sort of remain both conscientious of the killers and the the the, the Keep talking plays within the, the genre yeah absolutely and and so with that you always had you know an interesting sort of examination of archetypes and sort of you know the the male sort of dominated entitlement within the genre and then again like like you look at like the idea of of where we are now um technologically speaking even where you know a lot of this stuff is by design you know we were being um fed it or or watching it on television and now the world has gone to streaming and tiktok videos and so even when we see a landline phone in this movie there's a moment there where it kind of feels uh, you know very strange like you're being brought back to 
uh, the late '90s with 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 that one moment where you know the the landline phone, the portable phone, comes into play as if it is calling back to those original films where the majority of this is looking at the world now in a very kind of yeah. instant gratification kind of manner and how that all plays out and the set piece in 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 kind of the final act without giving anything away um works perfectly within the symmetry of the sequels and 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 part two in particular and um there's one performance in this movie that is really channeling uh laurie metcalf and timothy oliphant so uh be prepared for that but again like i think if you accept it for what it is and it is a much sort of you know we keep using the word campier it's it's over the top and and a lot of the screen movies do get to that point where it is ridiculous in terms of what the killer's plans are or why they're doing what they're doing um but it almost is like okay we're just going to embrace that kind of silly side and not necessarily yeah. worry about the scares but still be brutal in the violence and the kills and and but even then th- like watching this movie i between this and Megan, I got what I wanted to get out of uh, Cocaine Bear through these yeah. two films. Like, this movie is is a lot of fun. Like, it is a great movie to watch with a crowd. Yes. And it's a, the it's, kills it's are violent and fun. The, the humor is both intentionally and unintentionally very funny. Like, I feel like people will laugh at it. Like, it is a crowd movie, and I agree with what you're saying of it knows what it is and it knows it to play to its strengths and knows to not take itself too seriously, but then also at times take itself very seriously. So like I'm a thousand percent with you see this with the kind of biggest crowd possible uh, on opening weekend. Yeah. Um, it, yeah. And, and again, like it just, it kind of feels like it delivers on what it promises and it's not doing anything more, but at the same yeah. time, you know, uh, Matt uh, Bettinelli, Olpin, and and uh, Tyler Gillett um, as directors, they have enough savvy as both horror filmmakers and comedy filmmakers that they can bridge the two in a way that works. And you look again at Ready or Not, where, you know, not a perfect movie by any means, but every time that that film works you know it's 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 so much fun and it's so delightful and and you can see a lot of that i i would say even more so in this movie than you did in scream five where you know obviously we mentioned samara weaving and henry cherney um Mm -hmm. who were both in ready or not or now in this um you know like you're thinking about that movie in those moments but you're also thinking about it when you know things (coughs) kind of go to from one to to ten and a lot of the times they're played within kind of a comedic tension you know there's there's this weird kind of flux between horror but not feeling like you are watching something that is completely um depressing because because i feel like, like there are a lot of these slasher films where it's just like okay well they're misogynistic they're taking you know their their angst and pain out on women where this movie's calling out a, a mm-hmm. lot of that like even just like film bro culture has already mentioned but even the idea of you know people feeling that they are entitled or know something completely and nobody else has you know a say in the conversation whether it be on jallo or slasher films which i mean jallos are kind of a prototype of the slasher movie in a lot of ways so you know the the reference is there and then it also gets a little bit weird where you're hearing modern references that you don't think are going to be in a movie like this like the letterbox reference i think is, yeah is it's great where yeah. it's like okay letterbox has really kind of entered into the public consciousness as a cultural signifier to the point where we're now getting a reference in a major film about it in the same way that we have been getting Twitter and, you know, Facebook yeah. and things like that. But it that, makes where... sense for this kind of movie, right? Yeah. And, well, especially um... when you have someone like Jasmine Savoy Brown's character, Mindy, talking about it. And it's also just interesting that the core four are um, two sets of siblings. Um, yep. I think that that's kind of interesting as well, where it's it's almost like if you're not related to somebody, you're fucked. <laughs> Yeah, I like the Meeks Martin uh, twins, and I like I like them more. I like them in the last movie too, but I like that there were four survivors from the last movie, and um, I like them quite a bit. Yeah, I think everyone kills it, man. Uh, no pun intended. Like I think it's uh, 
It's an absolute blast. I'm going to give the movie, I could go even higher, but I'm going to go four out of five uh, on it. I think it's incredibly uh, enjoyable. It's still very much a Scream movie. So like it, if you like the Scream movies, I think you'll vibe with this. And um, I think it's just a ton of fun. So four out of five for me. Yeah, I'm going to give it three and a half out of five. I, I still think that the first and second movie um, are my favorites of mm. the franchise. But um, over time, I could see myself liking this even more um, and, and on a rewatch. And again, like there's a performance in this film that I think deserves uh, awards consideration. <laughs> you ha- you <laughs> had a gr- you had a great pitch for that um, for I'm just going to leave it at that, but we'll talk yeah. about it on a future podcast. Or yes. Something like yeah. That. Yeah. I, Cause I, there's I a, really want, which I feel like that's going to be in the next movie. Like, I feel like that has to be like, they, yeah, they uh, do. Yeah. And I feel like they will, but we'll see. But um, the actor who I'm, who I'm saying, I, I won't say who it is, um, is great and knows yes. what they're doing <laughs> yes absolutely absolutely um thank you so much for listening or watching we really do appreciate it uh please go check out uh some of our other shows um schedule wise the shows are a bit all over the place right now i promise i will uh, let you guys know what's going on with stuff whether um on twitter or maybe i'll post a short message on some of the channels if you listen to our other shows but um we're just we're not necessarily taking a hiatus or anything like that it's just eric and i have a lot of stuff going on um personal stuff um we're trying to keep up as best we can but we also have to make sure that uh, our mental health is in a good spot and that's coming from me i'm speaking for myself uh really um i love doing this show um this was such a cathartic you know 37 minute chat for me so like i really do love doing it it's just we might not be on schedule or get reviews out as quick as we normally do or main episodes. Like I know the Oscars are this weekend, so I can't wait to talk about them with Eric. So I'm hoping we'll have a main show next week talking about uh, the Oscars on the Untitled Movie Podcast channel. Obviously, you guys know that I love The Last of Us. It's near and dear to my heart. Uh, It's a tough show to watch, a tough story. Uh, Um but I love it so much. Um, I promise you we'll get you those last two episodes of the cast of us. It's a show that I really love doing. It just, it's a show that takes a lot of energy as well with note taking and their longer episodes. Cause we're going through beat by beat. Um, so I promise that you'll get those. They just might not be immediately as things come out. So I appreciate your patience. I appreciate everyone uh, who has, you know, said, Hey, take the time you need it's just a podcast kind of thing um and i love doing it it's just uh right now i'm trying to figure stuff out and um the show will continue matt and eric will return uh we'll have more reviews and more podcasts and stuff coming up it's just schedule wise please be patient with us and i know that might hurt us in the long run from people who aren't diehard listeners and things like that but um it is what it is kind of thing. So uh, I appreciate everyone. We will be back. I'd love to talk Creed three with Eric. Um, So maybe that'll pop up on the reviews channel. We might have some more reviews for things like champions and different things coming up. So um, it'll just be a little all over the place. So be patient. Uh, thank you everyone. Um, one stop shop for everything. Just he- head over to untitled underscore casts, uh, over on letterboxd. Hey. Um, <laughs> you'll be able to, you'll be able to find everything there and I, I, maybe I'll post a quick update, uh, over there as well. Um, just to let everyone know what's going on. Uh, cause I know that's probably where a lot of people, uh, found this show and different things like that. So, uh, and then if you want not tweeting as much anymore, but I still am, you know, got the odd banger, like lost the musical over on uh, twitter.com slash at Matt Rohrbeck or whatever the hell it is. So Eric off to you. What was the name of Charlie's song on, uh, on lost? Would that become like a full musical number? Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? I do know what you're saying. His band. It's been, I, yeah. I love that show, but it's, it's, it's been, it's a, been while. a while. <laughs> it's not that song. <laughs> yeah. It would be good though. If it was, um, I mean, it was kind of the same era. I mean, it's a little after, but like it was kind of like still in that perfect, like what, like Lost was 2005, 2006 when it started. So Stain was in the early 2000s. 
Um, yeah, so uh, you can find more of my, Drive uh, Shaft. <laughs> Drive <laughs> was was the band what was the name. name? The, what was the name of the song? And the, and the like, song you are was or something like yeah, that? we are everybody or something, yeah. aren't they? We are we everybody. Are everybody. Yeah, That'd yeah. be a great musical number. Um, <laughs> yeah, so you can find more of my video reviews on rogerstv.com slash cinema scene. I have a really wonderful uh, conversation with uh, I Like Movies director Chandler Levac and stars Isaiah Letton and uh, Romina Dugo. And um, yeah, it's a really wonderful little movie that's only being released right now in uh, Toronto and across Ontario. But um, if you can check it out, definitely uh, worth uh, the watch and worth the trip um, wherever the theater is whatever theater is playing it and hopefully we'll get a, a a wider release and an international release in in the months and year ahead it's 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 a it, it taps into speaking of early 2000s culture uh perfectly it's it's one of those movies and we reviewed it back on uh uh our our, our tiff yeah, sort of stuff you can so check you want to go back review, into yeah. the files there You're but yeah sitting in a park it, Going to what Matt said, like, we still have a lot of stuff that will, like, there's an interview coming up with, with Matt Ruskin uh, for Boston Strangler. There's still things. It's just that it might not come on, like, you know, time or, like, when an embargo drops right away. And those are the things that it's like, okay, you, you, sometimes you need to just step back, take a breath, understand that, you know, you need to work on yourself as a person and also need the time just to breathe and you know I, I mentioned breathing already but like that's important where it's like we live in such a fast-paced world because we live so much online now that it's like you know there's this kind of feeling that you have to always deliver you know or compete against everybody else and that's never mm -hmm. been our motive or, or or motto to begin with we never feel like or we've never felt like we've competed against anybody else when it comes mm -hmm. to doing this stuff we're bringing our own opinions to films and television and you know drinks and restaurants and stuff <laughs> that we like to talk about so you know we'll always be there and we're always going to have stuff it just it just takes a little longer and that's you know that's it's still going to be there it's still going to be good but just give us the time you know <clears throat> that we need in order to get it out there and and um we're appreciative to those people that always have been listening, you know, like the ones that uh, listen on either a weekly or biweekly, you know, uh, schedule or just kind of throw it on whether periodically they whenever they exercising movies they liked or, or, yeah. or, or hanging out or, mm -hmm. you know, even wanting to get mad at us. I, I you know, sometimes I, I think that's the other thing where it's like, it does hurt your, it, I saw that I read that article with Seth Rogen talking about like film critics being, too harsh on actors and that kind of thing but th there's something there when it comes to you know you you put everything into your work and you're not expecting to always create a picasso or something like that but even when it comes to film criticism and conversation mm -hmm. you know the, the way that you want to talk about something and you kind of sometimes feel like in your head you have this idea of I i'm articulating it in a way that i i know is going to be that that'll be exciting or will add something to the conversation. And then when you actually do it, you sometimes feel like, Oh, I didn't turn out the way that I thought it would, or I had it in my head. And then you still put all that work into it when you're editing it and putting together, you know, thumbnails and, and posting it online and sharing it with other people and putting it out there. And then, you know, you'll get a one star review for a last of us episode that says like, oh, these guys are crap. And it's like, well, you know what? Like the, the thing that you could do that would be more hurtful than that, and it would also benefit us because then we wouldn't have to see it, is not write a review at all. I'm weirdly advocating mm -hmm. for people to not write a review if they're feeling that negative because it's yeah. like, why put that in the space, you know? like just, I guess that's to Seth Rogen's argument. He could make he could say the same thing. Um, it's a whole nother topic. I agree with you. There's no point. We're a small independent podcast of just two guys doing something we love doing um 
So I think there's a difference there, but I, I agree with you. Um, oh, I, I think yeah. I think Seth Rogen can take it because he's paid millions of dollars and like <laughs> yeah. If I was paid millions of, those... of dollars, say whatever you want about me, I'd yeah, probably yeah. not and be And he's done right a now. lot of good work, right? Like it's oh interesting yeah, to, I know. like I, like critics have been pretty kind to him for the most yeah, part. But, yeah, and and um, and again, like you know, a, a couple of movies here and there. Whatever, and it's all bullshit. Because, Nothing yeah. matters. It's we just two guys with opinions. Like you said, we we do this for a living or because we're passionate for it. Uh, uh, And, you know, luckily we only have to answer for ourselves, but I also want to keep up with things and it does keep my mind off stuff. It does keep me going. So um, I'm hoping that we can continue to do it. It's just, you know, everyone's and everyone's having a tough time right now, I think, too. So and, and, and I know this movie is about murdering people innocent people and that's like something eric brought up of being like certain movies are a little bit more mean when it comes to that stuff where this movie has at least some fun in there or some commentary and that's what i wanted where cocaine bear was more like i was in a mental space of just being like well i don't want to watch this like this is just mean to me and then like where this movie it can be mean at times but ultimately is a fun ride and it did kind of help me take my mind off things weirdly even though it's a movie about a serial killer murdering people so whatever anyways thank you everyone we'll be back um soon just keep an eye on untitled movie podcasts uh untitled movie reviews and um the cast of us um will continue all of those shows just be patient with us we love you all uh take care everyone